Welcome to the Petro Papers podcast. Say that 10 times fast. This is where you get your oil and gas intellectual stimulation by asking the technical questions. I'm your host, Yoga Sri Pradhan. And with me here today, I have Ashwin Venkatraman. And we're going to talk about SPE 206303. I have the expert with me on this podcast, and I am going to talk a little bit about Ashwin before we get started with the paper. The paper description and the citation is in the description below for the podcast and for the YouTube video. Ashwin is the founder and CEO of Resermine, an award-winning startup, most promising at OTC 2018. He's worked for Shell for over 12 years in various roles in project management, reservoir engineering, and technology deployment. Dr. Venkat Raman also served as an associate professor for the Department of Petroleum and Geological Engineering at the University of Oklahoma in 2019 and 2020. He's also held postdoctoral appointments in Princeton, as well as the Institute of Computational Sciences at UT Austin, where he led the next generation modeling for reservoir characterization. He's the recipient of the inaugural SP International Technical Award in Data Science and Engineering Analytics awarded during the ATC conference held in Dubai early this year. He earned his PhD in petroleum engineering from UT Austin and has a BS and MS in chemical engineering from IIT Bombay. He actively teaches the SP course on reservoir applications of analytics and machine learning at various SP conferences. Welcome to the podcast, Ashwin. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, before I start peppering you with questions, there was a couple of things I wanted to mention. Ashwin's the inspiration behind this podcast, so it only made sense to interview him in his recent ATCE paper. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that, yeah, there is a lot in your bio that there's, there's just so much, and it was it's really awesome to read. And full disclosure, this is going to be covering conventional reservoirs for the most part, and I have an unconventional background, so most of the questions that I will be targeting are going to reorient myself in conventional reservoir engineering. And my exposure to capacitance resistance modeling has been all the stuff that Dr. Larry Lake has done. So I was really happy to read your paper. But before we get to the paper, I wanted you to briefly explain what does ResorMind do? Sure. No. Uh, well, you know, thanks for setting it up. And I'm really glad that uh, you took my suggestion seriously <laughs> about starting a podcast. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think you're contributing an important voice in the space. So really glad to do this. So back to your question on what ResorMind does, uh, you know, we are a startup working Um, in the space of automating reservoir surveillance and management. Um, So we have a browser-based product that kind of integrates uh, multiple models typically used in reservoir engineering for decision-making. So um, if you look at the space, uh, reservoir engineering space, decision-making space, uh, traditionally, it's it's been mostly about reservoir simulation, right? Um, uh, But what we've done is, you know, brought in some new and exciting workflows using analytics, machine learning, uh, some reduced physics model, CRM is one such model that can really help speed up um, a lot of decision making. What makes us unique in our hybrid modeling framework um, is the ability to really combine different models. So uh, such combination is of course useful because it eliminates shortcomings associated with each model if it were to be used by itself. We've had of course successes with uh, many applications, but the two which kind of stand out are one with uh, optimizing uh, injection operations for mature conventional fields, as you mentioned. Uh, Conventional fields, of course, you know, important as 70% of all oil comes from them. Um, And, you know, when you talk about mature conventional fields, obviously you have water injection, gas injection. So what we do there is help combine different models to quantify interval connectivity so as to drive decision making around you know, which wells to inject, water or gas or chemicals, and how much really to inject. The other application uh, that we've had some success with is acceleration of field development planning. Uh, Essentially, you know, using hybrid models that combine reservoir simulation, reduced physics model, 
all of that in a machine learning framework to essentially generate predictive maps, uh, which can help drive well location and well control optimization. Um, if you look at it, look at how these things are done, they're traditionally are done pretty manually. So you, you move well locations around, you run these simulations, wait for them. Uh, so we are automating in that space in that respect. Our product, of course, has been used for um, you know, metro fields here in the US, uh, Egypt, Germany, um, Mexico. Uh, and we are actually now working for some fields in, in Malaysia, Russia, and, and India. Uh, and of course, so it's very exciting having recognized, uh, having been recognized for some of our deployments uh, to see how the wider as well engineering community um, is really accepting uh, some of these hybrid models. So we are pretty excited about it. That sounds extremely exciting. I, it seems like you've already done it all, but I can't wait what next you're going to do with ResorMind. So that's, that's really exciting to hear. Well, since I invited you in the podcast to pepper you with questions on a particular paper, I was wondering to reorient our viewers and listeners to walk through the recent paper that you presented at ATCE, which is combining capacitance resistance model with geological data for large reservoirs. Sure. So um, this is actually among one amongst uh, a series of paper that uh, you know we've been doing. Uh, for the last few years in the, in the space of uh, the hybrid modeling approach. Um, so, you know, like you mentioned, capacitance resistance model, uh, you know, they've been around since the 1940s, right? Yeah. Um, often referred to as reduced physics model uh, and really introduced when there was a dearth of computational power. Um, there was, of course, you know, significant research done uh, back in UT uh, to kind of adapt these approaches to field data, you know, through Dr. Lake. Uh, who had a research consortium around it, right? Um, these are incredibly simple models uh, because they really capture first order physics, uh, especially to describe mature water floods. Uh, so think of simple mass balance where you assume every well is connected to each other. You obtain a neat analytical solution, which you kind of fit to production and injection data uh, to obtain a set of connectivity values between injectors and producers. This is especially very useful for mature conventional fields, uh, which have more than 60% water card, or perhaps you have just too many wells in the field, uh, which is a case of a lot of mature fields in, in West Texas uh, and, and also all around the world. Um, what you really need here is just production and injection data to obtain solutions. The central idea is that you know, mature fields pathways have been created because you know, you've been operating this field for over 20 years. Um, and the goal of capacitor resistance model is really quantify this connectivity and hence identify ways of optimizing. The fast march model, which is the other model uh, that we speak about in the paper, is another reduced physics model that kind of uses geological model as an input. Um, so not the production injection data, but the actual geological model as an input. Um, and that can also help us obtain connectivity information. Uh, this is, of course, a well-known technique. Uh, fast pass models have been uh, you know, used in multiple applications in several fields. Um, and these approaches were actually refined further for reservoir engineering applications in Texas A&M uh, by Dr. Akil, Akil Datta Gupta. What we've tried to do is uh, infuse the two approaches together. Um, talk about bringing longhorns and agis together. Huh? Uh, so what we really do is try and address shortcomings associated with individual approaches. Um, and in the paper, we demonstrate this uh, using a simple case first, and then we use a you know, full field case to further showcase how combination of these two approaches can work um, that can help you determine connectivity, um, as well as more importantly, uh, drive decisions around which wells to inject and how much to inject. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for reviewing that. And I really like the connection that you make when Longhorns and Aggies are coming together through through this paper. When going through the paper, I mean, I've read papers on fast marching method and separate applications as well with the capacitance resistance model. And I was just curious to know about the differences in the calculations or how does the fast marching method indicate connectivity compared to the capacitance resistance model? Because 
in the paper, you start noticing the differences in those in the differences in the results when when you when you incorporate them separately. So, I was wondering if you could expand on that. Sure. Uh, so the fast match model really relies on the concept of you know trying to track the fastest route. Uh, let's say the fluid injected would take uh, to reach from say the injector uh, to any of the surrounding producers. Of course, the input here is the geological model, as well as the fluid flow properties, uh, where you know one obtains from uh, you know a permeability map. Uh, so it's a simple pressure calculation where you go from permeability map to diffusive map uh, to actually doing a time of flight computations uh, through which you compute connectivity. On the other hand, the CRM approach, um, you know, if, if you look at the formulation, uh, just uses the production and injection data and no geological data really. So the idea is you're trying to arrive at connectivity values using these two approaches uh, that actually use different data as input. This allows you to see if you can establish an equivalence, uh, which uh, we do. And through that, use these results to actually feed uh, you know, results coming in from one model to the other, such that you can address some shortcomings associated, uh, which let's say the CRM approach. Thanks for that clarification. And I think that will definitely reorient our viewers and listeners as well, especially when they read the paper and notice the differences, especially in determining the in determining connected pairs and and especially in the speed of, of, of the computation. I was reading in the workflow of the paper that the first step was you had to determine non-connected pairs. And you talk about how non-connected pairs have to be normalized. And I was curious, why do they have to be normalized before we do anything else in the, in the workflow? Sure, so, so the connectivity values that you obtain from uh, the fast match model is actually coming in from the time of flight computation. So these are actual times that you obtain um, for the fluid to go from one injector uh, to let's say the closest producer. So as an example, if I1 and P1 is one pair, um, I1 and P2 is another pair, so you same injector but different producers, uh, if the time taken to reach from say, the injector to P1 is lower than uh, the injector to P2, um, I1 P1 well pair has a stronger connectivity, right? Because it's reaching much faster as against I1 P2. Uh, you could of course, you know, go ahead and you know rank the times as a measure of well connectivity. So, so that works well as well. However, in this case, because we were trying to compare it with the CRM model, where you typically get values between zero and one. So if you look at the formulation, it's a typical value between zero and one. So in order to facilitate that comparison between CRM and FMM, uh, you convert the time to an effective connectivity value uh, by normalizing this time that you obtain. Okay, thanks for that clarification. And I think, yeah, that, that does make sense, especially when you're trying to combine both of those, uh, both of those methods in the other part, as you go through the workflow, there's you mentioned about a user specified threshold whenever you're summing up connectivity values. And I know that provides some flexibility for the user in determining a threshold, but I would like to know from you, what should the user take into consideration when determining that threshold? Like what are some best practices? Sure. So, um, uh, you know, the, the threshold really depends on some previous knowledge of water floods, right? Um, and that really comes through um, uh, some organizational knowledge that you've had. Uh, and typically, I would think uh, best practices would be to take somewhere around 85 to 90 percent at the good threshold. What this really means is you're trying to track uh, only those producer wells surrounding the specific injector well, uh, that receive at least 80 to 95% or rather 80 to 90% of all the injected water. Uh, so what you're really assuming is just a 10% water loss from the injectors, which is actually pretty healthy for a, for a conventional water flow. Okay. Now, thanks for that guidance because especially you have a case in heterogeneous reservoirs where the 
where the threshold I mean, is different. It can be 75%, it could be 85%. I believe in the paper it was 85%. I had to ask this next question because I keep thinking about unconventional reservoirs and I think about micro Darcy, not just micro Darcy, but nano Darcy. So, and I'm also, and I'm trying to remember papers that for the fast marching method, there were unconventional applications. So I wanted to know from you, especially with water floods, maybe in tight, in, in tight formations, is there a minimum permeability or porosity value that we can use for this hybrid approach? Sure, so, so the CRM model, of course, is agnostic, right, of, of porosity, permeability values, because when you look at the formulation, all you're inputting is just production and injection. Uh, so what really comes into play is the FMM model, because the geological model is being used as an input. Um, but irrespective of the porosity and permeability values, you would still end up obtaining, um, you know, using time of flight calculations on times associated, and hence you will obtain connectivity. Um, of course, they will be of a different order of magnitude uh, on the unconventional. If you're using an unconventional reservoir, they'll be of a different order of magnitude as compared to, say, conventional reservoir, which is, you know, uh, well connected, meaning have uh, good permeabilities within them. Awesome. So, you know, really, there are no minimum values for this hybrid approach, I would say, um, but uh, it would make more sense to use these on conventional side. Uh, but the FMM uh, has been very interestingly used to uh, also determine drainage areas or drainage volumes around uh, specific wells in the unconventional setting. Uh, so essentially, what they allow you to do is through these time of flight calculations, essentially determine um, you know, how much of the area are you draining uh, if instead of an injector, you were considering uh, placing a producer there. So you could reorient this approach uh, towards not doing an analysis around injector producer, but just looking at it as a producer uh, to see and compute these drainage volumes uh, using this time of flight calculations. Mm. This is reminding me of an assignment that I had in Texas A&M where I was taking Dr. King's class, Michael King's class on upscaling geologic models. And we were using the fast marching method. We were coding the fast marching method and determining the diffusive time of flight. And now I want to input, I want to run a sensitivity on just running the permeabilities just to see how long it would take. Maybe I can crash the code. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to move on to, you provide a synthetic case for a homogeneous case with five millidarcies in a homogeneous field, but I want to talk about the heterogeneous field because I think that is more applicable in, they're just more real life cases, for instance. And you talk about an R squared fit where there is a reduction with the hybrid approach from 0.96 to 0.8. And I know that we, I mean, thinking about a statistical background, you also don't want to overfit a model or anything. And there's a, there's a threshold there on what is considered acceptable. So coming from that background, what is a minimum R squared to go forward with an analysis like this? Like when should we be okay with the hybrid approach? So the R squared of course is a measure of fitness between the model and the actual data, mm -hmm. right? Um, so and you know, what we've seen in our experience of solving for different field cases is I think anything greater than you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.75 is pretty good because considering all the variations that you have in a reservoir, um, I think if you're getting good fits around you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.75 uh, for some of these analysis, I think they end up capturing the first order of physics, uh, which can further be used for decision-making. Thank you. I was really surprised, especially with the capacitance resistance model, where I understand that you're trying to reduce, you're, you're upscaling your matrix and you're trying to reduce the number of connectivity or your calculations, that way you reduce your computation time. But one thing that I noticed in the paper is that there is also false positive connections that the hybrid approach actually can't, I mean, that I wouldn't say call out, but eliminates. From a conceptual standpoint, why does that capacitance resistance model develop false positive connections? So, you know, 
uh, as I explained, you know, CRM models really assume every single well pair in the field is connected with each other, right? So you start with that assumption, uh, which means, you know, you assign a parameter uh, to every single uh, injector producer well pair that you have. Uh, so essentially, when you obtain solutions in this construct, um, you obtain um, connectivity values or gain values, as we often refer them. And in some cases, uh, you often find that an injector seems to be related to, you know, some producer, which is really, really far off. Um, and, uh, you know, if you perhaps, you know, bring out the geological model, uh, if you're lucky to have that, you might actually see that, you know, uh, there is really not a possibility that these two pairs may be related. Uh, this is one of the challenges of just using a data-driven approach, where you end up seeing relationships uh, in this case, false positives, because you started out defining that those relationships exist. And so you're just using nonlinear optimization to perhaps obtain a best fit around it, right? Um, so this does occur in many field cases where you have you know, more than 500 wells. So let's say you're solving a large system um, and that's where you know, you're more prone to uh, obtaining such false positive cases. As an engineer, of course, you know you can typically resort to also other algorithms, like um, you know we, we've done in some previous paper where um, machine learning algorithms like uh, random forest can actually help determine uh, which well pairs are not related to each other. Uh, so that can also be a way of identifying pos positive. Of course, in both these cases, uh, using CRM or trying to use machine learning, in both these cases, you're still relying on the same input, which is the injection data and the production data. What we wanted to do different in this paper was to use the geological model as an input to see if we could obtain connectivity. Uh, it turns out the FMM model is able to do that. And one could use the FMM model results to actually go back and determine what might be the right radius of investigation around every injector. Uh, so, you know, doing that and then feeding it back into the CRM model um, really helps us do away with a lot of those false positives because what you're really doing is you're taking in a new data set, uh, you're trying to figure out connectivity and using that information to try and eliminate conceptually these false positive that you would otherwise receive if you were to just use one single model. Right. So if we were you, yeah, if we were to use that CRM, then we would definitely yeah, capture those false positive connections and you show that comparison to in the in the paper so thanks for that clarification especially with just the con the concept of crm and I think reor not just reorienting but just reminding people of some of the reservoir engineering classes when they were when they first had to learn what crm is there's one more question that i have to ask you before i let you go but I mean, I was very interested in reading the paper. And again, it seems like ResorMind's done so much already in, in the few years it's been up. What are the applications specific to this approach have we that we haven't seen yet in this industry? Oh, um, I think uh, what we'll start noticing more are combining different models uh, in hybrid manner. I think that is the future. Uh, that we at Rizomine are driving. Uh, we believe that is the future of uh, decision-making as it pertains to reservoir engineering. Um, what you will start noticing are, um, you know, using different sets of data as inputs uh, to even using results of one approach that feed into another approach, you know, like the case we discussed uh, in this paper, uh, to really know, uh, you know, which wells are connected, uh, which wells to increase injection and which ones to decrease injection. Uh, at least for those mature conventional fields. Uh, in summary, you know, where originally you just had reservoir simulation as a basis, uh, you now have other approaches, uh, the two reduced physics model that we spoke about, analytics approach, uh, machine learning approach, which really can be infused together in multiple ways for quicker decision making. Um, so another exciting area that we've been working on and which we've deployed recently are using hybrid models to kind of accelerate field development planning. Uh, so if you look at what's been traditionally done, um, and this goes back to you know, my experience of being a reservoir engineer myself, um, you, know, you, you probably have just a week to figure out where to place your wells and you know, given the dynamic model and you know, go figure in a week. Um, 
and you know somewhere uh, you know it's not possible to scan the entire solution space uh, you know you, you might be manually moving wells around you know, maybe you already have some parameters in your mind but uh, you know it's, it's just not physically possible to you know run multiple cases uh, so what we've tried to do there um, is really figure out are there ways in which you could automate that process. So essentially, you know, run a few simulation runs, uh, perhaps also use the fast match model runs and feed both of them um, onto a machine learning model, which can then help you generate these predictive maps. Um, and that itself could be integrated to a global optimizer to go back and say, you know, where to place your wells, um, what kind of uh, controls to have around those wells, so, you know, what rates to be produced or, you know, what bottom hole pressures to have around those wells. Uh, so essentially, you know, you're going from a single reservoir model uh, to having all this backend calculations be done in automatically to actually arriving back uh, the next day to notice, you know, a predictive map uh, where it identifies where you might want to place the well. Uh, so, so I think, you know, these are the approaches where, you know, combining different models, automating a lot of manual processes that we've been used to. Um, is what we are excited to work on. Um, and this is what we are bringing through our different products. And, uh, you know, I, we at Resubine also believe that I think the future of Resubine engineering is really Resubine engineering expertise in a box kind of a solution where a lot of these approach work in the backend. So, um, and that's, that's the future uh, that we are working towards. Well, thank you for explaining the components of the black box. <laughs> And that's a wrap, everyone. Thank you so much, Ashwin, one more time for letting me pepper you with questions on SPE 206303. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Really enjoyed this talk, uh, Thank you. Of course. Well, again, that's a wrap. You heard it from Ashwin. Please be sure to leave any feedback for me or any papers you wish for me to review and authors you wish for me to pick their brains with. I am Yoga Sri Pradhan and I am signing off. <laughs>